please turn with me in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then turn back with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Picking up in verse 18 through verse 20. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Now let us pray now together for our time in the Word. Lord, we thank you for how richly you have blessed us uh, in your word. Lord, we thank you for all of the vehicles that you have given us, whereby you work in us and through us. Lord, we thank you for the red word, the sung word, the preached word. We thank you that we can pray the word and see the word. Lord, for all of these things, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that your word is alive in all of these things. That by the power of your Holy Spirit, you are working. That you are accomplishing great and many purposes in the souls of your dear saints. So Lord, we, we beg of you. Be with us, Lord. Be with us as we examine this good word that you have for us. Lord, please apply it. Please work that good fruit that you have promised. Lord, may that good fruit be in us. And Lord, we beg this not because we deserve it, but because you are good. Lord, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for giving us this word. Amen. Now, last week, uh, when we examined uh, the first means of grace, read the word, uh, one of the applications uh, that was uh, woefully missing was uh, a corporate application. Um, that in the assembled worship of God, uh, we are to together read the word. And this has truly been the practice of the church going all the way back to uh, ancient days. The church has read the word of God. Um, the church has also preached the word and sung the word. And we're going to be talking about singing the word uh, this morning and the, the church from the ancient church all the way through today has uh, prayed the word and also 
seen the word in various sacraments. And though the way we saw the word this morning didn't look exactly like how they saw the word 3,000 years ago, uh, though the particulars may have changed, the essence, the substance of it, the central message of it remains unchanged. And so that brings us uh, then to sing the word. And we have, um, in both of these texts, uh, great examples of, thank you, brother, of singing the word. Uh, the first one that we read together in Colossians 3 and then in Ephesians 5. <clears throat> That's a very old manuscript there. <clears throat> so, um, in singing the word, um, what I'd like us to do as we work our way through is to see the, the way in which the sung word moves in the soul of man. And so, we have four, um, four headings that we're going to take this up. And first, we see the word coming in. And perhaps here I should have... Uh, entitled this, the word taken in, uh, then the word operating or acting within, then we see the word going up and the word going out. So first, the word taken in. We see here in Colossians 3, Paul writes, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. And this, the idea here is not that simply the, the word comes in and just exists. But rather, the word is dwelling. The, the word here for dwell um, carries with it the, uh, the idea of a home. Something lived in. It's not... The word is not just an inert body uh, sitting there in a dusty box over on a shelf, but the word is dwelling. And not only dwelling, but dwelling richly. See, there are people, there are unbelievers who have memorized great lengths of Scripture, perhaps even the entire Bible. And yet that word, it's in them in a certain way, but it, it is not dwelling, it's not living, it's not being operated upon by the Spirit. There's no life there. Which is why Paul is saying, let the word of Christ not just be in you, but dwell in you richly. The word was evidently with Satan. And Satan even brought it out when he thought it was to his advantage. But was that a word that was dwelling? Was it living? Was the spirit in and acting through that word? If we go to <clears throat> Ephesians 5, the, uh, the admonition here is, be filled with the Spirit. And so you might be thinking, well, that's odd to use for a text if you're talking about the, the Bible being sung. Um, yes, it speaks of addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, but the, 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 the main clause here and the one admonition is be filled with the Spirit. I would just submit to you, if we look back a little bit, Paul writes, um, in verses 17 and 18, he's got a pair of, uh, first a negative and then a pot, so a, a prohibition and a command, and then a prohibition and a command. So we see in verse 17, do not be foolish, but positively understand what the will of the Lord is. Now how do you and I have a hope of understanding what the will of the Lord is? Well, what more can he say than that which he has said? 
in his word. His word is how we understand, how we hear what the will of God is. Do not be foolish, says Paul, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we do that through the word. Verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but command, be filled with the Spirit. So what we have are these two parallel commands. Know what the will of God is and be filled with the Spirit positively. Those are the two things which we are to do. And who can separate the Spirit from the Word? The Word is the very breathed out. It is the Spirit of God breathed out. And so this admonition here, this command, is for us to to have the Bible taken in. So, and these, as I've noted, are both commands. Be filled with the Spirit. Address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then in Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let it dwell, brother and sister. These are good commands. So, the first idea is that we are to take in this word. That the word first comes in, uh, but it doesn't just come in to sit or just be over there. Be unconnected from life. Um, But we are to be meditating upon that. We're to be taking it in. And it's a life-giving, life-sustaining, active word. Now, once we take it in, the word is to work in us, to work on us. Paul writes that the word of Christ is to dwell in us richly. And then it has an outward function. We're going to get to that. But this dwelling of the word of Christ is at the end of verse 16 with Thankfulness in your hearts to God. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. Or Paul in Ephesians 5 writes that as we address one another, at that outward uh, element in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, what we are to do is be in our own hearts singing and making melody to the Lord. With our hearts. Now, with C.S. Lewis here, I would submit to you that our problem is not that our emotions are too weak. Our problem is that is not that our emotions are too strong, rather. Um our emotions are given to us by God for a purpose. They are a good gift to us. And so the Christian's problem generally is not that our emotions are too strong. But what is, what is the purpose of our emotions? Why did God give us this good gift? Well, our emotions are supposed to... So here's the a quick anatomy of the soul. Truths come in to the soul through our mind. That's what has to happen first. You, your, your heart, your emotions can never, your affections can never delight in something unless first you apprehend it with your mind. Your heart cannot love what your mind does not know. And so the, the truth enters. The, 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 the man sets his his uh, senses on an object, on a thing. He thinks about it and then his heart responds. And his heart may respond to that thing that he sees with joy or love or satisfaction, but it also could be with hate, with contempt, maybe even with anger. And so what God gave us, when he gave us our emotions, is 
is that these emotions would, would camp on, would delight in the truths of his word and respond accordingly. So when we apprehend, when we think about the great and glorious truths that are given to us in this word, our emotions are designed for delight. Now, we may look around and say, we have enough emotion or emotionalism in our society and maybe even within the church. We may say, that's that's not good. But actually, we can never have enough of it. However, we do have to be careful. Because emotions, just for the sake of emotions, a emotional experience, just for the sake of the experience, is not to honor God's design for our emotions. I once um, was... Uh, just like Josh and BJ, I, I chaperoned a group, a group of youth to a, um, a camp, for a mission, a camp. Um, and at this camp, uh, the adults from our local church, we were just one local church of many, but we were not in, in charge of the content or the program of, of this week. Um, but when we got there, the camp staff, who they're the ones who controlled the content, uh, they assured all the volunteers, the adult volunteers, when we were taken away from the, the kids, they said, Wednesday will be an absolute watershed. And it was. It was a watershed. There was hardly a dry eye. There were many, many tears shed that evening. But what was so sad, because I understood what was going on as I tried to minister to our young uh, men and women, what I knew is that they had been brought to a place of great emotion with no substance. As I attempted to shepherd our, our young men and women, I asked them, why are you crying? Which is a fair question if you if you ask it if you ask it right. Uh, I didn't mean it as sharp or harsh as or as a rebuke itself, but I, I was trying to understand and, and help them to see. Why are you crying, young man or woman? What is bringing you to tears? And I had over ten conversations that night and over the coming days, and you know, not a single one of them could tell me why they were crying. That is emotionalism. That is whipping up, stirring up the emotions for the sake of an experience and not for the worship of God. That is dangerous, but it's not the emotions themselves that are bad or dangerous. Emotions are good. Brothers and sisters, when we hear the word preached, when we read the word, and especially when we sing the word, our emotions should be sky high. And we ought to say, Thank you, Lord, that I get to experience this, that I get to be this happy. Emotions, brothers and sisters, are good. And so may we experience that. May, may our joy be brought to overflowing when we sing the Bible, when we are doing as Paul commands us and admonishes us here in Colossians and Ephesians. May the word dwell in us. And then as we, as we dwell on it, as we sing it out in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, may it be our delight. Because that's exactly what God created us for. And in particular, our emotions. Let's look next at the word going up. So last week, we talked about how God's word goes forth. And just like the rain and the snow, it doesn't just bounce back up to heaven and return void. It actually accomplishes something. So I, I've hopefully given it away. It's, it's to go up. Paul says here in Colossians 3, he says that it's with thankfulness in our hearts 
what, to our neighbor? To ourselves? No. But to God. To God goes these emotions, this response from our, our singing the word. It goes first and foremost to God. He is our chief audience. We're back in Ephesians. Paul says that we are to sing and make melody to the Lord with our hearts. So the melody is to the Lord. That's what it is first, before everything else. Our singing of the Bible is to Him. And this has immediate implication and application to us. Brother and sister, when you stand up, if you're able, wherever you're at, when you sing, we should be worried about not our neighbor, not the person in front of us, but we are making a joyful noise to the Lord. He is our chief audience. So God delights that the word comes down. It comes down. We take hold of it. We dwell on it. It, it dwells in us and it dwells richly. And then it comes back as, as we delight in it. We take hold of those precious promises of God, the beauty of his word. And we sing it back and it, it, it ascends to him like a sweet and pleasing aroma. The chief audience of our praises, the thing that delights him, is our worship. When we find to, our, our chief end is to glorify God. And and by enjoying him. And when we're enjoying him, when we're delighting in these things, that's how we glorify him. So the word comes down, it takes up residence, it's living, it, it's fruitful. And it rises back up to him. We sing back to him his word. And as we delight in it, it pleases him. But is this the only thing that it does when it goes forth? No. Lastly, the sung word goes out. And so, Paul says here in Ephesians 5, he says that we are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So we are, this is, though it's chiefly for God, it's also for our fellow believer. Or in Colossians 3. Let the word of Christ dwell, dwell in you first. But may it be teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom as we, and here's the vehicle, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So the way Paul says that we are admonishing our fellow, our fellow believer is actually through singing the word. So, what is it that, and how is it that this word is teaching? Well, firstly, and perhaps most importantly, is the truths themselves that are in the Bible. Those are the chief teaching agent, the chief teaching mechanism. That, that is the thing that we're communicating, is the truths. If we were to gather together and sing a Beatles song, it, it might be pretty as far as it goes. But, but that we, we wouldn't really be teaching one another. Or if we did, we might be teaching one another something wrong. Something that's a lie, a, a counterfeit. And so we're teaching primarily with the substance. But there's also a deeper lesson to be learned. And, and it's my hope that we've all experienced this. And that is, is we're teaching each other not only that these truths, these things that we know to be true in our mind, we're not only, we're not only teaching each other, hey, these things are true, but that they are good. That these are things that you, 
you, fellow saint, you ought to delight in this. In a sense, our worship, our delight is contagious. And God wants us to experience that that contagion. He wants us to be infected. He wants us to hear the voice of our fellow saint and say, wow, they're delighting in who God is. They're delighting in what God has done for them. They are testifying to the goodness and graciousness of God. And that's a beautiful thing. Now, for those who just got back from Minneapolis, no doubt you got to experience this on a scale, perhaps that it, it expanded your, your vision of what this could look like. And others of you have had the same opportunity, where here in this room we may have probably well over 100, but in Minneapolis, no doubt you had over 1,000 saints gathered together all saying, this is beautiful. It's not only true, but it's beautiful. What an encouraging, what an amazing experience that is. Others of you have been to, to maybe conferences, our own Reformation Boise Conference. We may not hit a thousand, but hundreds and hundreds of saints gathered in that room. All saying, these things are true, but more than that. We're confessing to one another. These things are absolutely delightful. There's nothing that, that nourishes. There's nothing that satisfies more than these truths. We're teaching one another by our own emotions being poured out in music. Music is designed for exactly that. So in closing, the sung word is a gift to us from God. Singing itself is a gift. Yes, it's a, a gift that can be abused. Yes, our emotions are, are things that can be hijacked, but we should not run away from them. We need to see them for the gift that they are and use them towards the end that God has called us to use them. Through singing the word, we're to remind ourselves, to remind each other, and to play back to God. This message right here is a good word. This is a message of, it's good news. This is a message of redemption. This is our song. It's not only about The, the truths of the Bible, but especially about a God who stands behind it and who is seen through it. A God who loves us radically, unconditionally, who poured out his wrath upon his son that we could be redeemed, reconciled to him. What's more exciting? What's more soul satisfying? So brothers and sisters, let's pray together and then I cannot wait to sing with you. Lord, we thank you for your good word. We thank you for just how you created us. Lord, we are also grateful for the image that you are restoring your saints into. That you are renewing us in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. Lord, may we not see abuses of the good gifts you have given us. And, and have these things steer us away from the gift. But let us press into your beautiful design. Lord, help us now to sing for all we're worth. Because you are worth it. We pray all these things for the glory of Jesus Christ. Your beautiful son. Amen.